Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm just going to share my screen and then we will get started. Um, so I'd like to talk to you today about managing critically ill and hospitalized patients. And these patients are very sick in most cases. So nutrition can play an important role in the recovery of these patients. We'll go over some of that in this lecture. So first we'll go over the importance of nutrition for critical care patients. Why do we spend so much time talking about nutrition for these patients? Why is it so important? We'll talk about assisted feeding. So tube feeding um, and routes of tube feeding. So different types of feeding tubes and dietary options for critical care patients. And then I have a case example at the end, a diabetic dog that we'll go over um, to talk about applying all the information I'm gonna talk about today. So nutrition obviously is important for critical care patients, but why is it so important? Enteral feeding or using the gastrointestinal tract to feed a patient is invaluable in these critically ill patients. First of all, it provides adequate calories to meet the energy requirements of body processes and metabolism. The body is not gonna work normally if it doesn't have enough nutrition. It helps maintain strength, immune function, wound healing. It improves outcomes and survival rates in hospitalized patients. And also the cells lining the intestinal tract, the enterocytes, they prefer to use energy coming from the food. You think about most cells, they use bloodstream nutrients. So the bloodstream goes by, they absorb nutrients from the bloodstream. The enterocytes preferentially use luminal nutrients from the food coming from the intestinal lumen. So if you don't feed those intestinal cells with the proper nutrients that they prefer to use, you can have issues with get gut barrier function um, motility can be a problem and other GI issues can arise. This was probably the first study that looked at the importance of early enteral nutrition in dogs. Um, this was a study that looked at dogs with parvovirus and the dogs in the early enteral nutrition group versus the fasted group showed clinical improvement faster than the dogs that did not receive food early on. They also gained more weight than the dogs that didn't receive food in the early recovery period, which these are these were puppies, they were dehydrated, so weight gain in the hospital is expected, at least to some degree. And you can see in this graph here, the squares are the early enteral nutrition group and the triangles on the bottom are the NPO group or the fasted group. You can see that the body weight change on the y-axis, it's significantly higher for the early enteral nutrition group and it becomes even more pronounced depending on what day of hospitalization you're looking at. So we know that hospitalized patients, they just do better when they get food. What happens when a patient doesn't eat? Um, there can be a lot of complications, but first glycogen is mobilized to maintain blood glucose, but this glycogen supply, the carbohydrate supply, <coughs> excuse me, is very quickly exhausted. Um, so the body uses that up very quickly. Amino acids are mobilized from the lean body mass to compensate for the calorie deficit um, nitrogen deficit and amino acids. So basically the muscle starts getting broken down in order for the body to meet those protein needs. If the animal is healthy and not eating, so maybe it's a dog that ran away and hasn't been having a regular food supply, um, you want to feed them like you would a critically ill patient if they've been off food for a while um, but it's important to, to note that those patients use stored fat first as an energy source. The sick patients that aren't eating typically use protein preferentially. And a lot of these patients that are very sick, it was chronic illness, they are underweight, they don't have significant fat stores. 
So that lean muscle mass gets broken down quite quickly, especially if the animal is very sick. I think of the three day rule is very important when I think about critical care nutrition. So the three day rule occurs um, when there's the, the malnutrition becomes more severe. Um, so if the patient hasn't been eating or hasn't been eating enough for about three days with significant anorexia or hyporexia, then the patient will start experiencing those metabolic shifts we just talked about. Um, carbohydrate sources are exhausted, muscle mass is getting broken down, they're utilizing protein and maybe fat as an energy source and not utilizing carbohydrates. As a result, depending on how you feed them initially, this can result in metabolic complications. So if they're not utilizing glucose and you provide a very high carb diet, then they may not utilize those and may become hyperglycemic, for example. Um, other things that can occur after the three-day rule has passed include enterocyte atrophy. So basically just the cells lining the intestinal tract start getting weaker um, and the gut barrier function is not as strong and there can be decreased immune function as well. This is a study looking at hospital outcome on, um, and how patients that received food did in the hospital in terms of discharge. Um, there were 467 dogs and 55 cats who received nutritional support while they were hospitalized. And it's important to note from the study that survival to discharge improved as nutritional support was implemented. So it was also dependent on the degree of meeting the calculated maintenance energy requirements or MER. So you can see here, 33% um, of MER or less, 60, 34 to 66% of MER, and then 67 to 100% of MER. Um, the animals that received closer to their maintenance energy requirements and for hospitalized patients, that's in general RER for current weight times one. Um, so I use resting energy requirements for current weight. Um, the patients that received closer to that amount in the hospital were discharged at a higher rate. So that's pretty significant to us um, to implement nutrition in your hospital because patients just do better. They have a higher survival rate. They have a higher rate of going home and doing better. Um, so nutrition plays an important role in the ICU. If a patient is anorexic or significantly hyporexic for three or more days, or if a patient's anticipated to be anorexic for longer than two to three days, I consider placing a feeding tube proactively or reactively depending on the case. Um, I also consider how long the patient hasn't been eating before they present to the hospital. So if they haven't been eating for a week and then the owner brings them in, that three day rule is already passed. So I try to think about nutrition as soon as possible in the hospital especially if the patient's been not eating for quite a long time. Um, but it's important to note that the three-day rule is a, gen uh, is a general rule. Um, in very malnourished animals that don't have protein, um, don't have a lot of muscle mass or fat mass, they have a low supply of protein and fat even in their own body. Um, so the three-day rule may be too long if the patient's really malnourished. When I'm thinking about starting tube feeding, um, I always want to do a nutritional medical assessment that's going to include standard things like a body weight, um, medical conditions, medications. You want to get a complete diet history during your physical exam. You'll want to get a body condition score and a muscle condition score to assess how the patient is doing from a nutritional standpoint. And the next thing I consider, this is probably even more important than thinking about how long the patient's not been eating. I always ask myself if the patient is stable enough to receive food. And I'm a nutritionist. I'd love to feed every patient, but some patients just aren't stable enough. They have either very high um, 
glucose levels and you have to normalize that a little bit or they have, um, they're very dehydrated or they have low potassium. Um, I usually take 12 to 24 hours to stabilize these patients before initiating feeding. Even if the three day rule is passed, um, I do like to make sure they're stable enough and that helps reduce metabolic complications from feeding. So next we have a poll question. Um, this is gonna pop up and I'll give you about a minute to answer it and then we'll go over the answer. Catherine, shall I read question for everyone, or you will read? Oh, is it? Is, did it pop up? For the, yeah, yes, um, it is. Okay, so we're going to talk about the answer in just a minute, um, but we'll talk about whether or not the um, what's the most important thing when deciding whether or not to start tube feeding, and also when to start tube feeding. You guys tell me when the most of the answers have come in because I can't see it. Should I go ahead and go? Yes, Catherine, uh, you can. Okay, cool. Okay, so we just talked about this. I just wanted to reiterate that the first thing I think about is, is, is if this patient is stable enough to receive food. Um, so sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes the answer is no, and we address if the case um, isn't stable enough to receive food at that moment. Um, I generally give them 12 to 24 hours. And then if the patient has an anorexic or hyperexic, that's a very close second. And I'll um, assess that as I'm getting them stabilized and decide what, what type of tube to place and how long and that kind of thing. So the first thing you wanna think about is, is the patient stable enough to receive food? They don't have to be totally stable, but I do like to give them some time to normalize blood pressure and electrolytes and hydration. All right, um, so for the amount, I uh, always calculate RER for current weight unless a patient is extremely obese. So if they have a body condition score of eight or nine out of nine, I sometimes use current weight depending on the patient. Sometimes I'll use this adjusted ideal body weight. And um, in that case, I'll calculate my ide patient's ideal weight and then I'll add back 25% of the difference between current and ideal. Um, I always use current weight if the patient has a body condition score of one to seven out of nine. And then I always use that exponential equation for resting energy requirements. And um, I don't start at that amount. If I'm starting tube feeding, I'll gradually work up to that over time, depending on how stable the patient is and how long they haven't been eating. We will get into that in a minute. Before I think about starting tube feeding, I always wanna see if the patient will eat voluntarily, especially if they were dehydrated or um, they're, they were severely hypokalemic. I might give them a chance to eat before placing the tube. And I might just use a couple tricks like warming the food, even if it's kibble, the warming it can bring out the aroma. Um, feeding in a quiet location, we all know that the hospital can be quite busy. Um, having the owner bring in something that they like and sitting with him, uh, sitting with the patient, that can be helpful. Um, the important thing to note is I don't like to cause food aversions. So if you have a patient with chronic kidney disease and you just diagnosed that and you need to switch them to a renal diet and you're not, you're trying to feed them orally, I would not start that renal diet right then. Um, just because, especially with cats, they can develop food aversions 
when they're not feeling well and associate that food with the not feeling well and then like never eat it again. I mean, they're cats, so it's not surprising, but it does help um, later management if you feed them something other than what they need to eat at home once they're, they're somewhat recovered. I don't recommend syringe feeding in the hospital. A lot of people do do it, um, but I don't recommend it for a couple reasons. Uh, one, I think it's stressful for the patient. Um, if they're nauseous, it can make things worse. And then it's pretty much impossible to get up to RER for current weight with syringe feeding. Um, so you're probably not going to provide enough calories to make it worthwhile. Um, feeding tubes are my plan of choice that the patient won't eat voluntarily. Um, we'll talk about the types of feeding tubes on the next slide, um, but I do consider proactive placement if indicated. So if the patient's not gonna be eating for an extended period of time, I place the tube earlier rather than later, um, just so I know that that patient's getting nutritional support during recovery. And then parenteral nutrition or IV nutrition is only re reserved for very severe cases. Maybe you can't get them to stop vomiting or they have such severe intestinal disease that they can't absorb anything um, from their food, any nutrients, or if they have neurologic disorders like a compromised gag reflex. So this is a chart with the different tube types. Um, and we'll go over this. I don't know how many of you guys are comfortable with placing feeding tubes or how many of you use them in practice. I know we have some vet students on as well. Um, but I think about the tube types as like short-term versus long-term. So nasoesophageal and nasogastric, they are very short-term tubes. They last maybe five days. Um, you have two nostrils, so you can get a little more out of it potentially, so maybe up to a week. Um, but for one nostril, the tube is generally going to last less than five days. Um, it's, however, very easy to place those tubes. You don't need anesthesia. You may need a little sedation um, and topical anesthetic in the nose, um, but they're super easy to place and they're very useful in hospital settings. Um, the difference between the nasogastric and the nasoesophageal tube is basically just where they end. The nasogastric tube goes all the way into the stomach, so you can withdraw fluid and measure gastric residual volumes. You can also decompress the stomach when you're withdrawing that fluid. Um, so that can be beneficial. The, esophage the nasoesophageal tube is beneficial because it doesn't interfere with the lower esophageal sphincter, so if there's chance of reflux or anything like that, um, and you're worried about esophagitis, the nasoesophageal tube can be helpful in those cases. Um, so I don't have a strong preference. I know some clinicians are more comfortable with NE tubes and some are more comfortable with NG tubes. Um, the other important thing to note for NE and NG tubes is that they only can use a liquid enteral diet with them. Um, so you can't put a can diet down a, a nasoesophageal or nasogastric tube, even if they're diluted with water, um, because you can't, you can't dilute it enough. The tube will clog. It's just such a small tube. Um, if you do want to use a can diet, I recommend the longer term tubes. Um, so esophagostomy or gastrostomy. Um, the gastrostomy tubes are also called peg tubes if they're endoscopically placed. These can last weeks to months. I'd say the esophagostomy tubes may be a little bit more intermediate than the gastrostomy, but you can switch out the tube at any time. Um, both placements require anesthesia, but it's also um, beneficial to consider placing these two types if you're anticipating that they'll be not eating for an extended period of time. Um, you do have to consider if they're stable enough for anesthesia because that is required for both of these longer term tube types. Um, in the bigger tubes, so E-tubes and G-tubes are bigger size than the nasal tubes. You can use a critical care diet, a canned critical care diet. Um, if the patient, if it's not indicated to feed a critical care diet, you can make a slurry with basically any canned food um, mixed with water or liquid diet, depending on how energy dense you want the blend. 
And then um, you can also use a liquid diet. It just um, maybe isn't totally practical to use a, a liquid diet through gastrostomy tube, for example, because they're so big. Um, it does accommodate a slurry quite well. Um, E-tubes are very well tolerated. So are PEG tubes or G-tubes. Um, the E-tubes are easier to place because they don't require endoscopic or um, open abdomen surgery. Um, but the G-tubes can have consequences if they're removed early um, and they need to be in place for at least 10 to 14 days. I usually say closer to 14. Um, J-tubes are the last tube type. These are used very infrequently. They go straight into the jejunum. And the thought is that they're, you bypass the pancreas um, when you're feeding in the jejunum, so you're not irritating the pancreas or causing enzyme release. Um, but they're very difficult to place. They require open surgery, um, so you, you can't place it endoscopically. You could potentially place it laparoscopically, but that's not super practical for most people. Um, and early removal will have serious consequences because like the G, the G tube, the J tube will have to form a seal against the body wall um, before it's removed. So those intestinal contents don't get into the abdominal cavity. Um, so those are our tube types. Like I said, the most practical ones are going to be the NE or NG and the E tubes, especially in general practice. Um, but if, if you're able to place a G tube for a patient that needs long-term feeding, that's great as well. All right. So here's a poll question. I'll let this pop up for you guys and I'll read it off. Um, if you have a patient with hepatic lipidosis that's so stable enough for anesthesia, um, what tube type would be most appropriate? And I want you to think about, again, the duration of the tube feeding as you're picking this tube type. Um, so think about how long a cat with hepatic lipidosis would need to be tube fed potentially and consider that when you're answering. I'll let you guys work on this for a couple more seconds. Are we good to continue? Have people yes, answered? Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so for this, I, I think about hepatic lipidosis case, cases needing anesthesia or needing a tube, a feeding tube for a an intermediate period of time. Um, so not very short term like nasogastric or nasoesophageal. There's no need for a jejunostomy tube in these cases um, because you're, you're just trying to get food into them. They don't, it doesn't need to be past the pancreas in terms of the intestinal tract. Um, so I think about an esophagostomy tube is the best tube type for hepatic lipidosis cats because you need nutritional support for at least one to two months. Um, so the nasogastric and nasoesophageal tubes will not last that long. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, we will answer some questions at the end if you do have questions. All right, so we talked about calculating resting energy requirements for patients based on current weight in most cases. If they're obese, maybe adjusted ideal weight, but current weight has is recommended from some nutritionists as well. It kind of depends on who you ask. Um, the amount that I feed on the first day, um, so I don't go up to 100% of RER on day one, um, but the amount that I feed will be dependent on the duration of anorexia. So if the patient's been anorexic or significantly hyporexic for less than three days, then I recommend, um, sorry, my dog's about to bark. I'm gonna move him. Um, if they've been anorexic or hyperexic for less than three days, I'll start with 50%. And that's more in like proactive cases. If they're around three days for their duration of anorexia or hyperexia, I start at 33% of RER on day one. And then if it's longer than three to five days, I'll start at 25%. And then you divide the total amount per day into four to six feedings, at least on day one. 
I say four to six, I give you a range because it's not practical for every hospital to feed six times a day. Um, that's every four hours. And some people don't have that capability. Four times a day should be the, the um, minimum though on day one, at least just to make sure the patient tolerates the feeding. You wanna administer each feeding over 10 to 15 minutes. And you don't wanna ex exceed five to 20 mils per keg per feeding. Now that varies depending on the animal. It depends on the anorexia, how long they've been anorexic or hyperexic. It depends on whether it's a cat or a dog. Dogs have bigger stomach capacity than cats. Um, and it depends how long you've been chew feeding them. So on day one, I try to stick closer to this five mils per keg per feeding if possible. You can go over that, but I would never go over 20 mils per keg per feeding for a hospital, for a two feeding patient. Um, and then I gradually increase to 100% of RER generally over two to four days. There are certain cases that they're really unstable um, and I like to go slower, but most patients will go, get up to 100% of RER in two to four days. Diet selection will depend on three factors. Um, one is just what you have available in your hospital. So that's a little bit easier. Um, medical conditions should be considered when you're selecting a diet. Um, you know, a lot of people think of canned critical care diets as optimal for tube feeding and they do go through tubes very well, but at the same time, they're not appropriate for every patient because of the nutritional profile. Um, so if they're high protein, high fat, that's not appropriate for every patient. The last thing I consider when I'm selecting a diet for a tube feeding patient is the type of tube that I placed. Again, if you placed an NG or an NE tube or a J tube, you would want to use a liquid diet. Um, if you place an E tube or a G tube, you can use the canned critical care diets when appropriate or a blenderized slurry of canned food and a liquid, whether that's a liquid diet or water. So I just reviewed this. Um, the uh, main option for NE and NG tubes and J tubes are the liquid diets from Royal Canaan, um, the ICU liquid diets. We used to have Clinicare and Clinicare RF, but they got discontinued um, a couple of years ago. So those aren't available anymore. And then I have used human products for tube feeding, but I worry about using them. So things like Ensure Plus or Vivinex is an elemental liquid diet. So it's broken down into like free fatty acids and amino acids, that kind of thing. Um, but they're not complete and balanced for dogs and cats. Um, you don't want to use them long term. Um, you could use them for a couple of days, but I do worry because cats have different protein requirements than humans. There's no taurine in these human products. So I do choose uh, to go with a veterinary product if it's an option. Um, and then for J tubes, again, liquid diets is a very small tube, um, but you could consider an elemental diet if available, um, just because you are bypassing the pancreas and the stomach, so your digestion is not going to be as good. Um, but the traditional liquid diets will work as well, and most patients tolerate them quite well. Larger tubes, so E-tubes and G-tubes, you can use any canine or feeling can diet that can be blended. Um, you can use a water or a liquid diet, um, and you always want to calculate the kcals per mil of your blend. So if you're adding water that doesn't have any calories. Um, you would just add in the total calories, of your food and total volume of your food plus liquid. Um, if you're using a liquid diet that increases the energy density in the kcal per mil. Um, so that's an option as well. Uh, but you can use basically any type of critical, any type of critical care diet or can diet through one of these larger feeding tubes. You just have to get it dilute enough to pass through a tube. Um, and then you wanna tailor it to the animal specific needs. So I think I just gave away the answer to the next poll question, um, but are canned critical care diets that are recommended for tube feeding appropriate for every cat or dog with a feeding tube? And I'll let you guys work on this one. I did just give this answer away, so I'm not going to give you guys this long. <laughs> 
on this one. We'll give it a couple more seconds. All right, um, hopefully everybody got a chance to answer this question. The answer is no. Um, canned critical care diets, like I mentioned earlier, are high protein and high in fat. Um, so that's not an appropriate nutritional profile for every patient that has a feeding tube. Um, we're gonna go into them in a little more depth now. So critical care diets, like I mentioned, they're high protein, high fat, they're low carbohydrate. So it's great in terms of matching what energy type the patient's using when they've been anorexic or hyperexic. Remember, they're not utilizing carbohydrates, they're more likely to be using protein and fat for energy. Um, they're high in energy density because of the high fat content, so it's a small volume. They're easy to administer through bigger tubes, E-tubes or G-tubes. Um, and when you're transitioning to oral intake, they're all very palatable. However, um, the nutritional profile, like I mentioned earlier, is not ideal for every patient. So if the patient needs fat or protein restriction, so pancreatitis and lymphangiectasia would need, those cases would need fat restriction. Uh, chronic kidney disease or protein losing nephropathy would need protein restriction. Uh, you could add hepatic encephalopathy to that as well um, for protein restriction. And then adverse food reactions are IBD. Um, you need novel or hydrolyzed protein in most of those cases. Um, and then some of them are not balanced for growth. So you wanna consider what you're using in a puppy or kitten as well. For nutritional math, um, just a brief discussion on this. We have two slides on math. Um, you always wanna KCAL, calculate your KCAL per mil. So KCAL from food plus KCAL from liquid divided by total volume, so mils from food plus mils from liquid. Um, and a, when you have a canned food that doesn't have a published KCAL per mil, I typically say one gram is about one mil. It's a little inaccurate, but not, it's very close because most canned foods that you'll be using are at least, you know, 80% moisture. Um, so that's the the calculation for KCAL per mil. Another thing to consider is how much hydration you're providing through the tube. Um, so there's water in the food with the moisture content, like I just mentioned. There's um, water that you're flushing with. Um, you're diluting the, the canned food in some cases with a liquid diet or water. And you can add additional water through the tube. So you can use a feeding tube to reduce IV or sub-Q fluids, which is great um, to meet the patient's water requirements. For monitoring, um, you always wanna monitor how much the patient's eating voluntarily. So if the patient's taking in food orally, how much is that patient eating? You wanna record that so you know how much to feed with the feeding tube if you've placed one, or if you haven't placed a feeding tube, you just wanna monitor food intake and body weight every day. You also want to uh, assess body condition score and muscle condition score. So body condition score, we talked a little bit about in terms of calculations for energy requirements. Um, body condition score assesses fat mass, whereas muscle condition score assesses muscle mass. I don't know how many of you guys are using MCS in practice or muscle condition scoring. Um, you can just assess a patient similarly to body condition score with visual exam and palpation. Um, the places I palpate are the skull, the scapula, the vertebrae, and the pelvic bones. Um, and you can have normal or decreased muscle condition score. If you aren't using it, I would encourage you to check out the Swasava uh, Nutrition Toolkit link because they have some good muscle condition scoring charts there. If the patient is fed too much or too quickly, you do have to monitor them quite carefully. Um, they can get metabolic complications if they're getting food too quickly. Um, that's why we recommend starting at 25, 33, or 50% of RER. Um, refeeding syndrome is kind of like the ultimate, I fed this patient too quickly. Luckily, I've only seen one patient in my entire career with refeeding syndrome, um, but they can get hyperglycemic um, and have very low electrolytes with um, magnesium, potassium, and phosphorus being the main ones. 
You also want to look for gastrointestinal side effects for any tube feeding patient. Um, and you want to, you know, con con consider decreasing the amount of feeding if you see nausea, regurge, vomiting, um, and there is a risk of aspiration um, that you have to consider as well. Ongoing monitoring, um, if you send a patient home with the E-tube or G-tube, um, you wanna monitor body weight, body condition score and muscle condition score. I say every week at the beginning and then if they're doing well, you can space it out every two weeks. Um, and you wanna adjust feeding to, to maintain ideal body weight and body condition. If the patient's in ideal body condition, that's great. You start there, um, you try to maintain that. If they're underweight after they go home, I'll try to get them to gain to ideal body weight. If they're overweight with the feeding tube, decreasing their body weight as much as it's important for the patient is probably not a huge priority right at that moment when they have a feeding tube. So I think of like hepatic lipidosis cats that are overweight but have a feeding tube, weight loss is not gonna be the primary priority right then. When do you pull the tube is a big question. Um, so I'll generally stop feeding if they're eating at least 60 to 75% of their RAR orally um, to try to give them a chance to eat more on their own. Um, and I generally try to get them to eat their full RAR voluntarily and maintain their body weight for a week before I pull the tube. Unless the animal pulls it sooner, obviously that's a consideration as well. Um, but you do want to consider, make sure that they're maintaining ideal body weight or getting up to ideal body weight as um, you're considering pulling the tube. All right, so we're going to move into our case example. But first, I want to go over my step-by-step -step approach to calculating feeding tube plans for these patients um, that you have a feeding tube for. So for every patient, these six steps apply when you're determining an enteral nutrition plan. Um, first, you decide a route of assisted feeding. So what type of tube am I placing? Um, you calculate RER. You can base it on current or adjusted ideal body weight, depending on their body condition score. Um, you want to calculate feeding amount for the first day, um, whether it's 25, 33, or 50% of RER. And then what are you going to feed beyond the first day, which is kind of um, see how it goes and then decide how much you're going to increase, um, but at least have a plan for how you're planning on increasing and as you see how the patient does. Um, you want to determine feeding frequency and kcals per feeding, and then you want to select a diet or liquid diet based on the problem list um, and what's going on with the patient. You want to determine the kcal per mil, whether you have to dilute a canned food or um, not dilute anything. Liquid diets, you don't need to dilute to get through any or NG tube. So that would just apply to canned food in terms of the dilution. And then you calculate the amount of feeding tube blend to deliver at each feeding. So the case we're going to go over is Gordy. Um, excuse me, my um, throat's getting dry. So Gordy uh, is a three and a half male neutered pug. He came into the hospital for evaluation of anorexia, weight loss, and lethargy. Uh, the owner had noted he had been PUPD for a couple weeks, so he was urinating and drinking more than usual, um, and he had been severely hyperexic for a few days. On physical exam, he weighed 17.5 pounds with a body condition score of three out of nine. So this patient's underweight. He had a mild decrease in muscle condition. He was quiet, alert, and responsive. Um, mucous membranes were pink and tacky, so he was dehydrated. Capillary refill time was less than two seconds. He was about 5% dehydrated. His heart and lungs, no significant findings in abdomen, no significant findings on palpation. So we do our diagnostics. We note that he has hyperglycemia, glucosuria, ketonuria, hyponatremia, and hypochloremia. So he's got a lot going on. Um, so we think about what our diagnosis is and we um, make our problem list. So he's underweight with a decreased muscle condition score. He's hyporexic. Uh, 
And then he has diabetes with diabetic ketoacidosis. So this is a DKA case based on the lab work and, and history. So when I'm thinking about route of assisted feeding, um, again, I always think about the duration of feeding first. Um, so how long does this patient need a feeding tube? And I'm gonna put this up as a poll question so you guys can answer this, but think about it in terms of days, weeks, or months. So I'll put this poll question up. What duration of assisted feeding is likely needed for this patient? I'll let you guys answer this one. All right, um, hopefully everybody had a chance to work on this poll question. I'm gonna keep going in the interest of time. I don't wanna run over too much and we wanna answer questions as well. Um, so short term for this patient, he's a DKA patient. We need to get his ketoacidosis resolved. Um, he's still gonna be diabetic obviously when we resolve the ketoacidosis, um, but he'll probably eat once he feels better from that and getting his diabetes somewhat regulated. Um, so I think this patient needs a short-term uh, feeding tube. So we're going to use a very short-term tube. Um, and then I'm going to ask you guys another poll question. For a very short-term feeding tube, what feeding tube type is going to be best for Gordy? I'll let you guys answer this one. All right, so hopefully everybody had a chance to answer that one. Um, and the answer for this one for ideal for short-term feeding is gonna be our nasoesophageal or nasogastric tube. And the reason for that is that um, they're very easy to place, they're ideal for short-term feeding and you don't need anesthesia so this patient can get a feeding tube quite easily. So you place an N or NG tube. Again, there's pluses and minuses of the, two feed, of the two feeding tube types, but I would base it on clinician preference. Um, so if you prefer to place any tubes, that's great. If you prefer to place NG tubes, that's great. Um, I don't think either one is wrong. Um, so whichever tube type you are more comfortable with, I think is a great option in this case. Um, you want to calculate his energy requirements for in-hospital feeding. So we use current weight. Remember his body condition score was three out of nine. So he's not obese. Um, and we get 332 kcals per day for his resting energy requirements. So we decide to start at 33% of resting energy requirements on day one. That's 111 kcals on the first day. Um, we're gonna manage him with regular insulin um, and then we have to decide for in-hospital feeding, are we going to do, especially with a liquid diet, are we going to do a constant rate infusion, a CRI, or are we going to bolus feed this, this patient? And again, either one is right. Uh, the constant rate infusion is nice because you can set up a syringe pump with the liquid diet. You can administer that as you're uh, working, you don't have to take 10 to 15 minutes, four to six times a day to feed the patient. Um, so that's convenient. The bolus feeding is thought to be a little more physiologic in terms of like um, meal volume being normal and hormonal release, including insulin, but this patient doesn't have insulin. Um, so that wouldn't be a consideration for this patient. So we decided to do a constant rate infusion for this patient. Um, he's getting 111 kcals on day one. We divide that by 24 hours for our CRI, and we get five kcals per hour. Now, this is our liquid diet selection chart. Um, so remember, this is an N or NG tube. We have to use a liquid diet for this patient due to the tube size. We don't need to dilute it, um, but we will need 
to um, use a liquid diet for sure. We can't dilute a canned food to go through an NE or NG tube, especially in a pug. It's going to be a pretty small tube. Um, so this is our chart. Uh, I put both human liquid diets and the canine royal canine diets. Again, there aren't there aren't a ton of other options out there right now. Um, recovery is our high protein, high fat diet. One kcal per mil is complete and balanced for cats and dogs. We have GI low fat liquid, um, which is for dogs only, renal support liquid, and then high energy liquid. Um, we have the human options as well, um, but again, uh, not necessarily necessary in this case. Um, I would recommend using a canine product over a human product any day if you're able to get it. Um, so that would be the consideration. Really only use a human liquid diet if you don't have an, a better option around. So again, they're not complete and balanced. They don't contain taurine um, and some amino acids that may be a, more essential for cats and dogs than people. Um, so for this case, um, we don't need low fat um, for him. He doesn't have pancreatitis. He doesn't have renal disease or hepatic encephalopathy or protein losing nephropathy. So there's no need to use a low protein, low phosphorus. Um, and then we could use, if he was very volume sensitive, the high energy liquid, which is more energy dense. Um, but in this case, I chose to use the recovery liquid. Um, so it's one kcal per mil. Our goal on the first day is five kcals per hour um, and a concentrate infusion would be five mils per hour. And again, this recovery liquid is gonna be high protein, high fat. Um, so you can utilize it for most patients unless they have fat or protein sensitivities. Um, so that's a great one to have in your hospital on hand if you, if you need it. Water intake, again, we consider the water in the liquid diet, the water for flushing, and any additional water we wanna put through the tube. This patient's gonna have an IV catheter. Um, you can do it in combination with IV fluids, um, but he is gonna need an IV catheter being dehydrated. This is a feeding schedule, and I like these to put together these charts just to make sure I get a handle of what needs to go on every day of the, the hospitalization period. So I, I charted it out for four days here. Um, again, we fed 33% on day one, 67 on day two, and 100% on day three and four. We're doing a CRI, so we divide our kcals per day by 24 hours to get our kcals per hour, and then we uh, divide by kcals per mil, which is just one in this case, um, to get our amount per hour. Um, so this is, uh, in the last column, it's mils per hour. And you can just set that up with a syringe pump, which is nice. Um, you don't have to be there all the time while you're feeding the patient. So once a patient recovers, he's not going to be in the hospital for a super long time. He's going to, you're going to pull the tube before he goes home. So he doesn't need to go home with the feeding tube. Um, and you have to start him on a feeding schedule for diabetes management. So I would recommend twice a day feeding and diet selection would be based on his needs. Considering he's underweight, um, I would consider that. And then also how he eats, he was anorexic before presenting. Um, so I would consider that as well. The plan after discharge, um, I since he's underweight, I would calculate uh, ideal weight and then recommend RAR for ideal weight times 1.4 to 1.6 to allow for weight gain. Um, we get our ideal weight is 21.9 pounds. Um, RAR for ideal weight is 392. Um, and then our, our maintenance energy requirements for ideal weight. So what we want to feed in a day is four is 549 to 627 kcals per day. And then diet recommendation for this guy, you could recommend the previous diet or you could recommend switching him to a therapeutic diet that's energy dense or recommended for diabetes management. Um, so depending on how he's doing and what he was eating before, you might consider a diet change for this guy. All right, I just have a summary and then I'll turn it back over and we'll start answering some questions. 
Nutrition is going to play an integral role in the outcome of critical care patients. Early implementation of nutritional plans for critically ill patients can improve outcome and survival. So that's that to me seals it. Like, of course, I'm going to feed my patients because they are going to do better. And you want to consider nutrition as a management tool for every patient, every visit, but especially for those that may be nutritionally compromised. So if you have patients come into the hospital that are underweight or um, have a, a disease that can be managed with nutrition, then I would consider doing that um, in every case. But think about it for everyone, um, but especially for those that are compromised. And that is my last slide. Um, I think we're probably going to have some questions. I'm going to unshare and then I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for this wonderful session. It was really awesome. And uh, I must say you covered various aspects which are related to the manage when it comes to the management of critically ill hospitalized pets. You covered uh, various things. You touched base upon the calculation of RER. You touched base upon various steps involved in the calculating or designing the nutritional plan. You you presented a beautiful case of Gaudi, and it was really a thrilling experience, Catherine. Thank you for so. Thank you for this wonderful session. Uh, I had already shared few questions with you, which are asked by the audience. So please go through it just one minute, brother, for you. Yeah. So yeah, meanwhile, I meanwhile, I will just uh, announce about the next session. So guys, next session is on 25th of June, and we will be uh, hosting uh, Dr. Vincent uh, Borge, who is our uh, who is a who is a health and nutritional scientific director of Royal Canin? He will be present uh, and he will be talking about the nutritional management in pets with a liver disease. So please do register yourself. Do join for that session also. So and if you have any question or query related to it, please uh, uh, do ask us. We are also sending a, a survey form for you to fill. Please give your survey so that we can improve. We can uh, we can improve in our future events. We can also uh, come to know what is your expectations from us, and we can we can be in better position to serve you in future. So, Catherine, uh, now uh, I will read the questions asked by the okay. participants. The first question is very important, and it's very common finding in India particularly parvovirus infection. Uh, and mm -hmm. in most of the parvovirus cases, it's very important to uh, design some dietary plan because you know already digestive tract is highly uh, inflamed and it is really difficult to design uh, to put to give uh, give certain things orally so how you will suggest uh, somebody like a, a uh, somebody like a clinician uh, who is treating a parvovirus case to approach this kind of a case? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, the first thing I would think about is getting the patient stabilized um, and also um, trying to get the vomiting under control. So most parvo puppies do have significant vomiting and you do before you can feed them have to manage that. Um, so once you're getting them pretty much managed with the vomiting. You don't have to get it to stop completely, um, but I would get it under control. Um, I would place a nasogastric tube if they're not eating voluntarily, which is pretty much all parvo puppies. Um, so I do recommend placing an N or an NG tube in these guys. Um, you can utilize uh, the high energy liquid would be my preference because it's so energy dense. You don't have to put a large volume in. Um, the tube to maintain these patients and that will help control the vomiting as well. If you're using a diet that has a low energy density, for example, you'll have to use more of it. Um, so I would recommend the GI high energy liquid. And then um, I'd probably start with a, a very low amount. So 25% of RER would be my preference for these guys just because I don't want to exceed their volume capacity and make them vomit. 
Um, but I do recommend placing tubes in parvo puppies. I think it really does improve the outcome and the study show that as well. Thank you, Kathleen. Hopefully that answers the second the question. question is, yeah, I hope to. And yeah. second question is from Dr. Satyam. Uh, he's asking about a critical case like a, uh, the canine distemper condition where usually you feel uh, you get a uh, epilepsy, which is very common in uh, canine distemper. So how we can design a dietary plan or how we can approach with, uh, with the, how we can do nutritional management in case of a puppy who are suffering with a canine distemper? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question, too. So um, my consideration, if they're having seizures regularly, I, if I'm gonna place a feeding tube, I would not do a CRI because I don't want them to be seizing when they're getting fed. Um, that significantly increases the risk of aspiration um, and getting them getting pneumonia. So I would consider if you are able to place a tube in the patient, placing an NE or NG tube to provide nutrition, I would just make sure your bowl is feeding. So feeding you know, four to six times a day um, versus feeding constantly like I did in that, in the case I uh, showed you guys earlier, um, just to prevent aspiration pneumonia. Um, there's no specific diet that can help with distemper, but again, I would also recommend like a, a high energy dense diet just because the volume control helps these guys, they can have GI signs as well. Thank you once again, Catherine. And last question, uh, considering the time. Uh, in case of senior cats, those who are suffering with uh, renal issues, uh, do you suggest us to uh, please suggest the dietary plan and how to approach them? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question too. And I think there will be a future webinar on renal disease as well. Um, but I... Generally, um, if they come in, I, I always iris stage them first. Uh, so that's the first step when you diagnose a patient with chronic kidney disease. So, get, so understand what stage one through four that they're in. If they're in stage two through four, they will definitely need a renal diet. Um, that's the iris recommendations. And I would also consider controlling the nausea like I talked about with a parvo puppy. So renal cats are really good at hiding things. Um, and I think they hide nausea a lot more than we think they do. So I'm, I'm very you know, generous with my anti-nausea meds in those guys just to keep them eating. Um, another consideration if they're not eating would be placing an E-tube. Um, that is a longer term tube. They're very easy to place in cats. Um, and you can administer a renal diet through the tube. You just have to dilute it with either water or the Royal Canin renal support liquid. Um, so you can, you can dilute the, the um, canned food with a liquid diet to decrease the kcal per mil or increase the kcal per mil, decrease the volume. Sorry about that. Um, so that gives you control over how much you're feeding, which can also impact how they feel. Um, the E-tube is also really nice because if you have to administer fluids, you can give fluids through the tube and you can also give medications through the tube so the client doesn't have to, you know, medicate their cat three times a day or whatever it is. You can just get the medication to go through the tube and flush it through the tube. Um, so I do consider E-tubes in a lot of renal patients, and I always consider using a renal diet, even if they're eating voluntarily um, from iris stage two and beyond. Hopefully that answers the question. So thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for Absolutely. accepting our That's short, short time request and, and making yourself available and delivering such a wonderful session. 